Today is an opportunity to remind ourselves what the U3A movement is all about. Our model, a self-help and self-funded organization where those who teach will learn and those who learn also teach, has brought joy of learning to hundreds of thousands of third agers. Our continuing challenge and opportunity is to bring it to many more whose lives it can enrich as it has enriched ours. I'm particularly delighted to see so many former national executive members with us today. Their broad shoulders have carried us forward through the years. As we celebrate U3A's 30 year anniversary, we can see that we have gone from strength to strength. I'd encourage everyone to catch up on early U3A history through Eric Midwinter's fine book, 500 Beacons. So let's now give praise to Eric Midwinter, who, together with other founders, Michael Young and Peter Laslett, made it all possible. Eric, you've been an inspiration to me. And I'm proud to introduce you and invite you to give our first Founders Lecture. Eric. Okay. Barbara, friends, there was a policeman on, on his beat in Manchester many years ago now, in central Manchester, uh, late one evening, and he noticed a drunk appearing to commit an act of nuisance. In fact, I, I hate to uh, add a sombre note to this salubrious occasion, but what he'd done, in fact, he'd urinated in the porch where Marks and Spencers. <laughs> now, that's really sordid and disgraceful, isn't it? Tesco's, you could have understood. <laughs> Anyway, the policeman went over and arrested him and he, he, he was uh, in front of the magistrates in the Daytown Street Magistrates Court the following morning and the policeman gave his evidence. He said, um, I was uh, proceeding on my beat at 11.30 last night in the centre of Manchester when I observed the defendant committing an act of nuisance in the doorway of... Uh, a well-known department store. I went over to him and said, here, what do you think you were doing? <laughs> and the defendant's reply was of such an obscene and disgusting nature that I cannot read it out in public, <laughs> but I've wrote it down on a sheet of my notebook, what I'm tearing out and handing to the magistrate's clerk. I then said to the defendant, it appears to me that you've committed a, an act of nuisance uh, and that you're intoxicated. And his reply was of such an obscene and disgusting nature <laughs> that I cannot read it out in, in public. But I've wrote it down on a sheet of my notebook, which I'm tearing out and handing to the magistrate's clerk. I then said to the defendant, I'm afraid I'll have to take your name and... Address. <laughs> and the defendant's reply was of such an obscene and disgusting <laughs> nature that I cannot read it out in public, but I've wrote it down on a sheet of my notebook, which I'm tearing out and handing to the magistrate's clerk. I then said to the defendant, I shall have to arrest you on likely charges of being inebriated and committing an act of nuisance. And the defendant's reply was of such an obscene and disgusting nature that I cannot read it out in public, but I've wrote it down on a sheet of my notebook, which I'm tearing out and handing to the magistrate's clerk. At this moment, the defendant shouted out in a very loud voice, Manchester City for the cup! And my reply was of such an obscene and... And, uh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much.
I think I'll finish on that. <laughs> I don't get any better than that. Um, what, what I've done today is to tear a few uh, sheets out of my notebook, and I hope they won't be too abusive or uh, obscene. Uh, it was once confidently asserted that the Duke of Windsor could be absolutely relied upon to say something rivetingly stupid on any subject. Today, such are the myths and paradoxes I shall describe that I fear some may feel I am following that ducal example in first describing the subliminal impact of schoolboy literature upon the national psyche, before second, analyzing the flaws of the educational system, and then third, promoting the U3A ideal as a wonderful solution for present ills. With regard to schoolboy literature, the autobiographical Tom Brown's School Days, published in 1857, was of course the inspiration. But perhaps more significant than the barrage of the heavy artillery of the hundreds of books was the intense bombardment of the light artillery of thousands of comics. It began with the Boy's Own Paper, BOP, launched by the Religious Tract Society in 1879 as a counter on behalf of the integrated culture of earnest middle and aspiring working classes to the degrading penny dreadfuls marketed at youth. BOP, which holds the record for the longest running young people's journal ever, had an estimated readership of two million by the 1890s, during which time it was challenged by Chum and the Captain. And BOP was forced a monthly publication in 1913, but struggled on until 1967. The staple fare was the school story. Talbot Baines Reed's prototypical, the fifth form at St. Dominic's, was serialized in BOP in 1881-82 and printed in book form in 1887. It was reprinted in scores of editions until as recently as 1971. Talbot Baines Reed provided the genuine template for schoolboy literature. The stolen exam paper kind of subplot, the rags, the what rot slang, the remote head, the dry, sarcastic beak, the bully, the sneak, the dandy, the duffer. The stage was set for the celebrated comics that devoted themselves almost entirely to school tales. Commercial Amalgamated Press and Fleetway Publications produced The Gem from 1907 and The Magnet from 1908, the latter soon selling 200,000 copies a week with a vaster readership via loans and swaps. Enter Charles Hamilton with the pseudonym of Frank Richards and indeed 24 other aliases, weighing in with 60 to 70 million words of school stories, the equivalent of a thousand full-length novels. He's deemed to be the most prolific writer ever. He invented 105 fictional schools, St. Jim's, Rookwood, and in particular, Greyfires whose famous five, not forgetting stern Mr. Quelch, were imprinted on the public imagination, while Billy Bunter is still a household word. He was, incidentally, named after a rather obnoxious nerve tonic. <laughs> In the interwar years, and although Magnet and Jem sustained a battered survival to World War II, along came another crop of weeklies. From the D.C. Thompson stable, beginning in 1921, came Adventure, Skipper, Rover, Wizard, Champion, which, while not so exclusively as their predecessors, included the boarding school yarns. Some may recall Hotspur's Red Circle with the irascible Mr. Smug, a Quelch clone. It was programmed from the outset for 1,155 episodes, and unlike Greyfries, it was organic, in that the pupils, like dead-wide dead Dick Doyle, grew up, left, and were replaced. It ran from 1933 to 1958. It has been calculated that 75% of pre-war secondary school boys and girls read one or more of these weeklies. And the character of these stories stem from the creed of their writers. Tom, Thomas Hughes ingeniously inserts his muscular Christianity into Tom Brown's school days. Tom's alter egos are the scholarly gentle Arthur and the tough, sporty Scud East, 
respectively representing the Christianity and the muscle. Thomas Hughes defined his creed as the protection of the weak, the advancement of all righteous causes, and the subduing of the earth that God has given to the children of men. A Christian socialist, he said, my sole object was to preach to boys. It's because games, especially cricket, were seen by Hughes and his ilk as a moral and physical preparation for life that as a cricket historian I became aware of this, for beginning with Tom Brown, many stories end with a cricket match, usually a match-winning stand illustrating some deep and asexual friendship like that of Oliver Greenfield and Horace Rainsford of St. Dominic's. For did not E.P. Benson, author of the ripping school yawn, David Blaze, argue, in many ways, he said, boys are a sex quite apart from male and female. Reed was a disciple of Hughes, a dedicated muscular Christian, serving those parents, as was said at the time, who wanted their offspring to have something manly to read, manly being the vogue word for the outcome sought by such schools. Frank Richards, in turn, had Reed for his mentor, and he too was a muscular Christian. He wrote, Let youth be happy. Happiness is the best preparation for misery. It will help the boy to grow in confidence and hope. Curiously, Frank Richards never once in his life visited a boarding school. All of them entertained the reversed theological view that school was the Eden, the paradise coming before, not after, the stern duty, the serious duty of the army, the church, the colonies. And there were good points about the intense penetration of schoolboy literature in this prolonged indoctrination of British youth from the 1850s to the 1950s. It was normally well written, especially when compared with the later genre of comics, with many pictures and little reading matter. And what P.G. Woodhouse called sinless pickles and Benny Green jockstrap jocosities embraced a bluff and hearty faith that had its, had its appeal. There's a wide testimony to its influence, and it's very conclusive. Just to cite one of many, many examples, Robert Roberts, in his eloquent text, Classic Slum, has written at length of the power of greyfriars in darkest, impoverished Salford. With nothing in our own elementary school that called for love or allegiance, greyfriars became for some of us our true alma mater, to whom we felt bound by a dreamlike loyalty. Over the years, these simple tales conditioned the thought of whole generations of boys and set ideals and standards. In the final estimate, he continued, it may be found that Frank Richards had more influence on the mind and outlook of young working-class England than any single person, not excluding Baden-Powell. It would be folly to underestimate the beneficial impact of schoolboy and indeed schoolgirl literature. Let's not forget Angela Brazel, who, beginning with The Fortunes of Philippa in 1906, wrote some 50 boarding school novels. But was there a downside? Here, another of my interests, British comedy, enters the discursive fray with a topic that puzzled me so much that I once published an article about it entitled, Why Did Everybody Understand Will Hay? Will Hay, the schoolmaster comedian, created the shifty defensive caricature of beleaguered authority, the embattled schoolmaster, Dr. Muffin. At the root of his gigantic stage, radio, and film success, however, lurked a curio. His St. Michael's is obviously a boarding school with all the patois and conventions of such snooty establishments. Will Hay's audiences would have been personally unfamiliar with such schools. Educated at elementary schools, they would have left at age 12 or 13. The leaving age was only raised to 14 in 1918. Only 4% of boys, much less of girls, attended fee-paying schools as boarders or day boys. There was a limited series of mainly fee-paying grammar schools with about 1914 only 12,000 free scholarships annually for the entire country. The vast majority of boys, such as Robert Roberts in Salford, started work at the very age that the tiny privileged group actually entered their public schools. And yet, 
Will Hay was perfectly comprehended. From where did his vast myriads of fans glean the background knowledge to make intelligible Will Hay's brilliant guying of posh schooling? And part, if not whole, of the explanation must lie in the surfeit of schoolboy literature of the period. Not the least of these effects was the induction of generations of children into the rudiments of boarding school life. They were thereby enabled to pick up every last smidgen of Will Hay's detailed portrait. Even unto Troy weight was invented by um, the Helen of Troy. And uh, avoir du poids comes from three French words, avoir to have, du of the, and poids. Um, poids, sir? Yeah, yes, peas. Peas, sir? Yes, because I mean, in the reign of Louis XV, they used peas for weights. What did they do in winter, sir? Oh, well, they used tin peas then. <laughs> and so the demented logic uh, went on. Clearly, the population had formed a detailed mental set of what secondary education was. Isabel Quigley, in her study of this phenomenon, had no hesitation in writing of what she called the brainwashing of generations. Their expectations of school and their conventions, she wrote, were familiar to everyone, including youngsters growing up to be ordinary teachers in state schools. Among many examples, we have H.E. Bates, author of The Darling Buds of May, who wrote of going to Kettering Grammar School, where I knew very well I should have to learn Latin and French and a new kind of English in which words like cads and bounders and beastly fellows played a large part. <laughs> and as a first-generation grammar school boy myself, I knew exactly from these comics that I would correctly uniform, face detentions not staying in, prep not homework, prefects not monitors, break not playtime, and daftest of all, I would be in a house a term that reached back to the old-style school where the master would lodge one or two boys in his own house because they came from a distance. In my particular school, the argot included doff for steel and pills for testicles, a peculiar outcome were one to doff one's cap and swallow one's pills. <laughs> the educational historian P.W. Musgrave summed up the whole business in declaring... It was a wonderful myth which influenced school life. Schoolboy literature had immense implications for the new state schools. No other kind of school has ever had the benefit of such propaganda. One of Will Hayes' schools, Narkover, and Chiselbury, the school of his bucolic successor, Jimmy Edwards, a sort of jovial Wackford Squeers to Will Hayes' wily Mr. Chips, are reminders of prison a clue to why Frank Richards and company chose the boarding school for their venue. For the same reason that Agatha Christie has Hercule Poirot detached from the world in a country house with an identifiable list of murder suspects. It is the penitentiary element. What the scriptwriter David Croft, he of Dad's Army and other series, call a trapped environment. Frank Richards knew the literary value of keeping his cast of boys in claustrophobic quarantine. But it was an unappetizing recipe for general education. And luckily, the critical point for the expanded construction of state schools fell in the 1900s and afterwards, when this Greyfriars typology was all the rage. There was a mainstream argument between the liberal and conservative parties about the format of post-elementary schooling. When some ambitious school boards, the local bodies established by the liberals in 1870, attempted to add technical lessons for older children. There was a conservative outcry about the illegality of such public expenditure, and the Cockerton judgment of 1899 agreed this was so. When next in power, the Conservatives abolished the school boards and transferred education to the county and county borough authorities they had founded in 1884, with the remit to provide some secondary education. Now, the author of the 1902 Act, which legislated to this end, was the first permanent secretary to the new Board of Education. A most politicised civil servant, Sir Robert Morant, Winchester and Oxford, 
sought to put a wholly classical stamp on this new dispensation. The assassin of the boards, as he was called by the liberals, believed, and I quote him, in submitting the impulses of the ignorant many to the control of the few wise, being safe to add that he counted himself among the latter. <laughs> His 1904 memorandum of regulations for secondary schools, and only those schools who complied with it received grants, was extremely old-fashioned. It was the only show in town, and worryingly, it embraced the cloistered aspect of the boarding school, itself a borrowing from the ancient Oxbridge monastic tradition for day school purposes. Thus, the secondary school shut itself off architecturally as well as curriculum-wise from the norms of its host community. It became what Henry Mollis, founder of the much-praised Cambridge Village Colleges, called the secluded school. And such were the conservationist elements at work, it was apparent that, as one rueful commentator later said, we would teach our children as though they were going to become our grandparents. It is, in my view, a distinctive mark of failure that after 150 years of endeavour, education has to remain compulsory and has not become so attractive that children would not dream of avoiding it. When I see truants standing shivering on street corners or in drafty shopping malls, I wonder what their school must be like that this is the preferable option. Many years ago, I was talking to a group of teachers and mentioned the old-time practice then of children having to raise their hand to us uh, to leave the room as the prurient request ran. I said they should be allowed to go whenever uh, they needed. One teacher said if Johnny Brown could go to the lavatory whenever he wanted, he would stay there all day. Why, I asked, was the lavatory more welcoming than his classroom? <laughs> this lack of attraction is mainly a critique of secondary schools, although I'm afraid that primary schools, some of which I have to say in the past have been the sanest places I've ever visited, are also under pressure to tow the formalised, prescribed, traditional line. Despite the civilised work of many humane teachers, schooling has been rarely patterned to the fundamental needs of children, especially adolescents. Much of British schooling remains locked in the sterile moulding designed in the first part of the 20th century, docilely accepted then by a public saturated by a deluge of school story images. If there was ever a case of nature imitating art, this is it. And thus in the second part of this lecture, I turn to the way this plays itself out in a series of myths about the relationship of education to any economic growth, social mobility and the like. For starters, let's get rid of the genes. In 2009, a review paper was published in the prestigious Nature Journal overseen by Francis Collins, one of the original leaders of the Genome Project, and by 26 other prominent geneticists. In what is a monument to scrupulous scientific honesty, they reluctantly accepted that after 700 genome scanning scrutinies, at a cost of $100 billion spent, geneticists had not found more than a fractional basis for human disease and allied attributes. It was largely accepted that the effect of environment, environmental variation on fairly uniform genetic makeup was a profounder cause of differences. In the same year, 2009, the leading geneticist, Professor Robert Plomont, admitted that genetic effects account for only 1% of quantitative traits such as learning. In 2010, the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry ran the parody headline, It's the Environment, Stupid. Now, it's been a truth understood for about 60 years by educational researchers that social environment is the most critical factor in regard of educational outcome. The research done for the Plowden Report on primary education in 1967, with which Michael Young was heavily involved, produced an outline that has been replicated in many surveys since. It suggested that when it comes to educational attainment, the, the home and the neighbourhood together outgun the school 
in the ratio of four to one. The school is not in its own right an engine for change in social mobility, as is often popularly thought. The story begins at birth. At 22 months, a child's development score is already, according to some experts, an accurate predictor of educational outcomes at 26 years of age. Those first preschool months in the community are highly significant, especially linguistically, where, according to American research, the child in a professional household may hear 50 million words by the age of four, as opposed to 12 million words in a welfare household. When it comes to social, a social activity like education, nurture, wax nature, all ends up. If I may immodestly cite my own contribution to these findings back in 1977, I published under Michael Young's aegis a profile of the then 104 local education authorities of England and Wales. I prepared an index for the social composition of each. I listed the usual investment or input figures such as expenditure per pupil or uh, pupil-teacher ratios. Then I logged by way of outcome the percentage of the age range at university. There's barely any noticeable correlation between those input figures and the consequent outturn in education attainment. Whereas well, a computer analysis calculated that the correlation between community determinants and educational achievement was as high as 98%. Armed with those figures, I was able to do a conjuring trick of foretelling the educational results from 7 through to 18 for any area without any knowledge at all of what the schools were like. It is this environmental effect that renders the mantra of equality of opportunity inoperative because you are not processing youngsters in a social vacuum. The 1944 Education Act, which promoted the concept of secondary education for all, was supposed to deliver on this ideal. By the 1960s, it was apparent that this was not happening. With university entrance doubled to 8% of the age range, the 30% of the population labelled middle class produced 70% of the students, and of course vice versa. In the 1970s, it was calculated that the proportion of working class students at university was the same as in the 1920s. The student numbers were much higher, of course, but the relative sums were the same, despite all the ballyhoo of improved access and decent grants. And so it continues today, with over 40% moving into higher education, whereas four-fifths of the children of professional parents progress to university, only a seventh of those of unskilled manual parents manage so to do. The school, therefore, is not an efficient change agent or forcing house. Rather is it a stage in an already programmed process, an endorsement of a position already determined by the home and neighbourhood into which you were born. Eaton does not change an ordinary schoolboy into a cabinet minister, as a magician might turn a frog into a prince, or to avoid any suggestion of prejudice against ordinary schoolboys, a prince into a frog. <laughs> it is a component in a preordained social conveyor belt, a staging post on the avenue of life in which you have been fortuitously located. There is a Calvinistic gloom about the social consequences of birth. There once was a man who said, Damn, I suddenly see what I am. I'm a creature that moves in predestinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. Yet it costs billions of pounds. And for generations, politicians of all parties have hailed it a significant factor in economic growth. Massive investment is committed to the education system, which is supposed to service the labour market and the economy. Is this justified? Well, the evidence is very much more mixed than is usually allowed. There is a strong counter view that, as educational economist P.B. Walters has claimed, vast education expenditure is a luxury a consumer goal rather than an investment goal. That is, as he asserts, unrelated to the process of economic development itself. Others examining the relationship globally find it difficult to spot the join 
between the educational investment and economic performance and suggests the payoff is extremely low. In other words, we have an extravagant education system because we have a sophisticated economy that can afford it and not the other way around. Although the Industrial Revolution had successfully taken place without it, some Victorians argue that schooling for all was necessary for economic survival. In consequence, there grew a strong belief that literacy only began to improve in England with the famous Elementary Education Act of 1870, which laid the base for universal compulsory and free straight state schooling. The assumption had been that without regular instruction, reading and writing must have been at a low ebb, but the potency of the community had been forgotten. The exceptionally dedicated researches of, in particular, W.B. Stevens, have shown that by 1870, literacy had reached the level of as much as 90%, some claim 95% of the population. How else was it possible to have a society in which a staggering 450 million letters were annually read, written and read alongside a massive extension of newspaper and serialized novel sales? Apart from the schools that did exist sporadically before 1870, credit must go to the efforts of the homes and communities at large. For example, many of the huge number of women in domestic service were taught to read and write there. So why did the money-conscious Victorians opt for so vast an apparatus of schooling, and what purpose did it serve? How necessary in humdrum economic practice in terms of trying to keep the economy going was this fairly sudden lurch to a full-scale system. Now here we come to the hidden agenda of educational history. As late as the Newcastle Commission on Education of 1861, the view was being expressed by their report that one could not deny what they termed the peremptory demands of the labour market, and that making children go to school was robbing the family of much needed income and leading to poverty. The scene, however, was rapidly changing. By the time the 1870 Act was being considered, improved industrial technology was curtailing the need for child labour. This produced a situation in which thousands of children between the ages of 9 and 12 or 13 had neither school nor factory to attend. This constituted a grave social problem. As many as a million listless youngsters, four-fifths of the age cohort, were roaming the streets, including up to 300,000 in London. As is still the strident way of politicians, these social casualties soon had the tags of opprobrium fastened upon them. Child idlers, street Arabs, the children of the abyss, the residuum, the dangerous and perishing classes. There was a strong motivation to use schools as a means of social control. With the subsequent 1880 Compulsory Education Act and an effective leaving age of 11, the formation of a custodial system was completed for which a major impetus was attendance rather than skills. The liberal-minded John Stuart Mill, a heartfelt opponent of compulsion, argued persuasively that rather, rather like a driving license, uh, once you'd mastered the skills, that was fine, you could leave school, but no, the point was to keep him off the street system. And in the first two years of the Liverpool School Board, 1871-73, for instance, 1,500 parents were fined and 234 imprisoned for truancy offences. That is why today, and apart from judicial imprisonment and some elements of the mental health legislation, children of school age are the only British citizens faced with enforced incarceration. John Stuart Mill would have approved of the description of Mark Blau and other educational economists that schooling amounts to a protracted aptitude test, overlong and as an economic tool, overextensive. The school leaving age and the retirement age are bookends detected by, uh, dictated by the needs of the labour market 
on the second age shelf. So if our massive expenditure on education is so feeble in its effect, how does social mobility to which education is attributed such amazingly magical powers occur? Well, in the first place, it must be remembered that this is a society based on status and money, not blood. In a word, it's a class, not a caste system. There's always been some social mobility. Thomas Beckett, Thomas Wolsey, Thomas Cromwell, notable historical illustrations. There has usually been sufficient examples to encourage the faith that some get on, some climb out. Including a popular culture packed tight with them. Every panto plot is a sample of cross-class triumph. Aladdin, Cinderella, Dick Whittington, Jack and the Beanstalk. In the second place, there are occasional sea changes in social history that create an out-of-the-ordinary opportunity for major recruitment from the lower into the middle classes. One such was the fiery crucible of the Industrial Revolution, when there were several rags to riches stories. Just to pick an instance or two from the retail revolution, concomitant with industrialism, who would have guessed their upward bound future when, in 1860, the 10-year-old Jesse Boot helped his widowed mother run her herbal medicine shop in Nottingham? Or when James Sainsbury and his wife Mary Ann opened their grocery at 173 Drury Lane in 1869? Or when Michael Marx asked Tom Spencer to partner him in 1894 with his Penny Bazaar in Leeds? Or when William Henry Smith joined the family news vending shop in Little Grosvenor Street, London, in 1846. W.H. Smith splashed out on a large country estate, became one of the landed gentry, and also a rather competent cabinet minister and the model for Sir Joseph Porter in HMS Pinafore. Then there was another such social shift after World War II, which probably caught one or two of us, when there was a large-scale expansion of professional posts, especially in the public services. The numbers employed in the health and education services treble between the 1950s and the 1970s. In 1880, a tenth of the working population were employed in education, health and public administration. In 1980... It was a third. As many as two million were employed just in education. At this stage, nearly 40% of those emerging from higher education obtained posts in the education industry, thereby lending support to the cynics who said education was about those who taught John Milton to those who taught John Milton to those who taught John Milton. The 1944 Education Act, the grammar schools and the shibboleth of equality of opportunity took all the glory. Once again, cause and effect had been uh, mistaken. Cause had been mistaken for effect. The truth is that social mobility is only possible if there's somewhere to clamber to. A window ledge at the top of that fabulous ladder that politicians are always excitedly telling us about. There's no point Jack climbing the beanstalk. There's no giant to slay and treasure to grab the conditions that we are in today. Then in the third place, Newtonian physics does not apply. Social mobility, when it occurs, defies gravity. What goes up stays up. There is remarkably little evidence of downward as opposed to upward mobility of the children of bankers slithering down the snakes, leaving room for the children of shelf stackers to climb the ladders and take their place. Indeed, it's more a matter of pull the ladder up, Jack and the Beanstalk, I'm all right, bag the tre treasure and marry the princess. And talking of uh, Jack marrying the princess, David Willits, the conservative minister and leading thinker, has pointed out that what is rather unromantically termed assortative mating has consolidated the current middle-class format. In the last 40 years, there's been a very welcome 12-fold expansion in the number of women at university. Principally coming, like male students from affluent homes, they have been likely both to marry or partner such men and also obtain highly salaried jobs themselves, thus creating the formidable tranche 
of double high salaried households that has further strengthened the firm hold of the middle class oligarchy. And the resultant concretion of this upper group and the bequeathing of the same privilege to their children is in practical effect an endorsement of Michael Young's perceptive and prophetic text, The Rise of the Meritocracy, published in 1958, but written as in 2033, with its modern explanation of how the meritocratic class would emerge as the ruling class and replicate itself. And nothing is more troublingly curious than the complete reversal among politicians of Michael's meaning and the idea that the meritocracy is okay. With Michael's resilient belief in the potential worth of everybody, his was a dystopian view. For the meritocracy implied a disrespect for an exclusion of the unmeritorious classes. He forever wished for a society where all were valued with equal dignity, recalling the lambasting given by his own mentor, R.H. Tawney, to a tadpole society in which the many were cast aside and just a few frogs rose to the surface. Michael Young believed that in John Ruskin's inspiring words, there is no wealth but life. Yet politicians of every party have come to regard the meritocratic notion as admirable. On all sides, it's hailed as a laudable vision. This is a travesty. It's like calling Welling Garden City Dickensian, or Lancashire Hotpot Kafkaesque, <laughs> or, or Paradise Orwellian. In fact, there is an Orwellian overtone of reverse meaning, like the Ministry of Peace in 1984 being devoted to war. Would that there were, every time the meritocracy is written or spoken of as a good thing, a cultural lamp that could be automatically lit that shone brightly forth the message, meritocracy is a bad thing. P.S. The book won the Silver Cash Prize for Best Satirical Essay. <laughs> and thirdly, and finally, therefore, I turn in more constructive mode as in what could be done to improve the educational system. The system is succinctly summarised by the story of the mother trying to persuade her son to get up and get ready for school. She said, give me two good reasons why you shouldn't get up and go to school. And he pulled the bedclothes down and he said, I hate the children, the children hate me. Give me two good reasons why I should get up and go to school. For one thing, said his mother, you're 47. <laughs> and the other thing is, you're the headmaster. <laughs> Currently, currently, it is a recapitulation of the emperor's new clothes. For no one in the vast education industry, let alone in a, in the, in a political establishment that has invested so much money and so much credence in the setup, would dare to cry out that the emperor was naked. Perhaps we should accept at face value that public education has little socio-economic rationale and serves chiefly as a holding base for the pre-work age group. Then we could relax and concentrate on education for its own sake. Then we could abandon the national curriculum, something of an oxymoron, for the curriculum that is not personalised is barely worth contemplating. We could abandon, once aware of the false notion of the economic dividend, the terrible confusion of education and training. Of course there must be training, but that should come later and be more closely associated with the jobs sought when the motivation to train is strongest. We could abandon the John Peel timetable which hunts packs of children from a view in the art room to an Ulu in the gymnasium to a death in the chemi lab in the morning, as if 30 children are already at the same hour for the same diet. For example, I, I walk about London for hours waiting for someone to ask me to do a simultaneous equation. <laughs> All because I was subjected, like everyone else, to the daily celebration of holy maths. And the same could be said of every other 
of the traditional subjects. And these are not new thoughts. Matthew Arnold, himself a despairing inspector of schools, and incidentally the brother-in-law of W.E. Foster, the minister responsible for the seminal 1870 Education Act, was already arguing against the stifling, wasteful effects of prescriptive instruction and rote learning as early as 1862. Using the repeated line, inspect the cartouche boxes, that is cartridge cases, he compared quite deliberately the school with the army. Whatever disaster might befall the militia, ill-drained or ill-hutted camps, whatever else, the only action, action was the trivial irrelevance of constant testing, as in inspect the cartouche boxes. And then again, amongst Charles Dickens, many portraits of teachers, one that has a continuing resonance is that of Bradley Headstone in our mutual friend. Dickens wrote, he had acquired mechanically a great store of teacher's knowledge. He could do mental arithmetic mechanically, sing at sight mechanically, blow various wind instruments mechanically. From his early childhood up his mind had been a place of mechanical stowage. The arrangement of his wholesale warehouse so that it might always be ready to meet the demands of retail traders. History here, geography there, natural history, the physical sciences, figures, music, the lower mathematics and whatnot, all in their several places. In this age of league tables and tests, those past comments ring several school bells. How preferable it would be to provide children with education as a life-enhancing and liberating force, so that when it came to adult, uh, adulthood, they would still be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, confident, outward-looking, curious, interested, cooperative, ready to take on the roles of worker, neighbour, partner, parent, friend, reader, television viewer, shopper, computer user, voter, leisure seeker, all in positive vein. What the radical sociologist A.H. Halsey called eager apprentices for community life. The key is enjoyment. I very genuinely believe that no true education occurs without enjoyment. Not in any idle lotus tree way, but in a challenging, provocative, disrupting, stimulating manner. I'm absolutely on the side of the customers, the children. To insist on children spending 10,000 hours of their life in schools without a reasonable guarantee of happiness and contentment is plain wrong. Children's lives are there to be lived at this moment, not put on hold for some misty future. All summed up beautifully in the five magical words of the great American educational philosopher John Dewey, participation in, not preparation for. A joyless classroom is heartbreaking, but despite the efforts of fine schools and fine teachers, the experience of Molly Tulliver in the mill on the floss echoes down the generations. When she had, wrote George Eliot, just come away from a third-rate school with all its jarring sounds and petty round of tasks. And thus to the miracle. Organise education in this, this fashion and the results improve. From several possible evidence-based studies, I choose that of Professor John Hattie of the University of Auckland, published in 2009. It was the synthesis of 50,000 surveys undertaken over 31 years between 1976 and 2007 throughout the English-speaking world, involving no less than 83 million children. Of 138 possible approaches to raising attainment and standards, by far and away at the top are two related to pupil-teacher interaction and child-centeredness, with teachers encouraging children to question teachers, to assess themselves and reach a view on their own levels of understanding, and to become involved in the actual teaching. Conversely, approaches like setting by ability, frequent and external testing, Shifting school typologies, as in faith schools, single gender schools, or academy type schools, come extremely low, with our old favourite smaller class sizes, 106th out of 138. To quote 
Dylan William, Emeritus Professor of Educational Assessment, what makes a difference, he says, is children talking to teachers about what they need and getting a changed response from teachers. Remember Anna Leon Owens, teacher of the Siamese royal children in Rogers and Hammerstein's The King and I. It's a very ancient saying, but a true and honest thought, that if you become a teacher, by your pupils you will be taught. <laughs> getting to know you, getting to know about you. Well, admittedly, it's a bit schmaltzy, but you will agree that things have come to a pretty pass when Oscar Hammerstein has a profounder grasp of educational principles than Michael Gove. Well, a cheap but effective shot. <laughs> <laughs> is there anywhere then, is there anywhere in this country where there's a working model that could be the saviour of this failed setup? Is there anywhere in this country where there's a working model of a service rather than a system? Where education is for its own sake and for that moment, based relevant on individual but attend willing, not grudged or enforced, where this engagement with mutuality is threaded into the interstices of the community in church and civic halls, social clubs on walks and trips, playing games, and most endearing of all, in people's own homes, instead of confined within enclosed institutionalised premises. A model where the mood is ever companionably supportive and the involvement life enhancing to the, po to the point where social, physical and mental well-being improves to the benefit of the individual, the family and the community. And where, most importantly of all, each individual re is respected, valued and esteemed of being of equal worth. Is there such a model? <laughs> it's the, uh, oh God, it's gone for a minute. Uh, oh dear. A quick edit before they take you away. Name of the Prime Minister, David Cameron. <laughs> Price of a first class stamp, 60 pence. 12, that's 12 shillings in real money, isn't it? 60 pence, it's amazing. It's not you, it's not you can't remember it, you can't believe it. <laughs> It is, of course, the University of the Third Age. And when Peter Laslett and Michael Young and I attempted the national launch of what has become probably the most successful pioneer enterprise in social cooperation and self-mobilization since World War II, of one element we were very certain. We never thought of this as some reach-me-down, make-do-and-mend, cheapo, second-hand device for bringing some educational sucker to the old folk at home. We simply believed that this was the best, the most efficacious, the genuinely top-class developing an educational service. Moreover, we believe that U3A did have many lessons to teach the ex existing educational system. And not content with that, we believe that society as a whole would be vastly improved were it organized on similar lines of decentralized, self-energizing and cooperative principles. For all the tremendous successes of their glittering careers, I know from my very last conversations with my, Peter Laslett and Michael Young that the U3A ideal, gradually unfolding an attractive and flourishing practice, was close to their hearts recognizing as they did that it approximated more nearly and more realis realistically than practically any other instance to their own concept of the good and just society. As it says in A Christmas Carol, we're all fellow passengers to the same grave and not a race of different creatures bound on other journeys. 
The tale is told of a collective farm in the old days behind the Iron Curtain. It was a very isolated collective farm in a very remote spot in one of the outback Soviet republics. And this collective farm was visited by the agrarian commissar. And he said to the chief peasant, Comrade peasant, he said, what is the potato harvest like this year? Ah, oh, comrade commissar, said the peasant, the potato harvest this year is so massive and marvellous that it rises from the very soil of our motherland, high, high into the heavens, even into the lap of God himself. Very good, comrade peasant, said the commissar. The state will reward you. There's, but there's just one small point. It's been safely and securely ascertained by the empirical uh, application of the Marxist-Leninist principles of economic determinism and dialectical materialism that there is no God. No, comrade commissar, send the peasant simply, and there are no bleeding potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, Friends, over against the empty hollowness and high-sounding theory, half-baked educational churning around us, it's the U3A that provides the genuine article, the honest reality, the down-to-earth potatoes, if you will. Your distinguished pioneer predecessors, several of whom I greet with appreciation and relish on this occasion, and those you here today represent, have built a solid foundation. On that secure base, may you 3 a burgeon and prosper. The model not only for what older people may achieve, but also for how our educational service and indeed our social system might develop. Let you 3 a flourish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Engaging. Stimulating. Thought provoking. And lots of fun. With enjoyment. What more can I say except thank you, Eric McWinter, Mr. U3A.